Yeah, um, I would love to say that disobedience is something that has only started in this generation, but it's not true. The apple does not fall very far from the tree. So we are going to be talking, this is, if you see my, my title here, the title that just keeps on going, this is the title that, that never ends, right? Um, we are looking at, we've been going through Genesis, and i got to tell you, there are times that folks have looked at Genesis, and maybe that's been you, uh, where you've looked at Genesis, the, the first book of the Bible, and see in it things that are sometimes fantastical stories. Like stories that we will have seen, and especially if you're a child, and you've been in, going to Sunday school, you have heard some of these stories a million times. I mean, we've got, how, how many toys that are Noah's Arks and, and little, and, I mean, you see Noah's Ark, and, and, and you almost get the idea that Moses, who wrote Genesis, put these stories in so that the children's ministers would have something to do. Right? But that's not the case. When Moses wrote Noah's Ark, it wasn't just for the kids, it was for everybody. So the title of this sermon, we start out with that, that title. This, this is going to be a moment. This is a, a key moment in the telling. We're even going to get to the Tower of Babel. And the key moment, this is Rick's paraphrase of what is said in the ancient Hebrew. Right? You're not the boss of me. It's an extreme paraphrase. How many of you ever heard that phrase, you're not the boss of me? You may have used it. Not very long ago, you may have seen elements of that said in separate ways, even up here on the platform. Just a few seconds ago, you're not the boss of me. So really what this is, is this is the lead up to the Tower of Babel. So we've we uh, just finished the flood. We talked about the flood last week, and we're running right into the Tower of Babel. And it's easy for us to go, well, these are a lot of stories that normally we don't pay attention to. Or even worse, they're the genealogies. So-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so. That's usually when, you know, the New Year's resolution that I'm going to read the Bible this year, it usually dies somewhere in the middle of the begots, right? You're like, so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot. I... Why do you have this in here? Well, I'll tell you why he has it in here. The, even the begots are, there's prophecy, there's history, it's all woven together. In it. And about prophecy, let's talk about the problem of prophecy. Um, prophecy, prophecy is very challenging in literature. Why do you think that is? Why would prophecy be a challenge in literature? Well, if it doesn't ever happen, they lie. It doesn't ever happen, they lie. And think about this. If you write down a prophecy, somebody else has to probably rewrite it, rewrite it without it having happened. Mm -hmm. So there's always the temptation of not having it in there. Let's just scrub it out. Or the other one is that it's supernatural. When prophecy is fulfilled, it's supernatural, right? means supernatural, meaning that it's, I mean, in a very literal sense, it is not the natural. Not, normally, we see cause and then we see effect. We normally just can't say effect. This is going to be the effect, not the cause. So prophecy is a problem. It's a lot easier to write a prophecy if it's after something happened, right? But that's not supernatural, that's fraud. Now the Bible, i got to tell you, the Bible is has all sorts of supernatural in there. And what we've had is there's been points where teachers and professors have come at the Bible and said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and go and look at like these first five books, we'll call them the books of Moses, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, these are the books that, that the tradition has held that Moses wrote. So what we'll do is we'll go in there and we'll say, well, let's just get rid of all the supernatural. So what they do is they start stripping out the parts of the Bible that they're like, well, this happened after Moses, so he couldn't have wrote it. Somebody wrote it later. So they start stripping away the supernatural to try to get down to the natural stuff. And that leaves you with pretty much the genealogies, right? Pretty much. Well, here's the challenge. Even the genealogies, and we're going to hit them today, the genealogies are prophetic. So if you strip out all the supernatural parts of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you don't have anything. 
Because what we see in this is we see kind of this where God sets out prophecy and then it becomes history because it becomes fulfilled. But then even that is a prophecy that leads to the next thing. It's kind of this a repeat, repeat, repeat. So we'll start out by talking about this right here was what happened, what he said to, to Noah after Noah and his family after they got out of the boat was this. He said, God blessed Noah and his sons and he told them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Does that sound familiar? What's he say when he puts people in the garden and afterwards, right? He says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. See that again uh, in uh, 9-7, right? Now be fruitful, multiply, repopulate the earth. We see that. As a matter of fact, this pattern continues on over and over and over again. It's echoes of the garden, but it's more than that. Remember when I said every place that it says the world in Genesis what, the, what they were hearing, the Israelites that Moses was talking about, wasn't the word world, it was land. Eretz means land. So they're saying the promised land, the land, the land, the land. So you keep seeing that out there. God laid out the land, and he put it in a garden. And in the garden, this happened, and he drove them out of the land. And it's land, land, land. So we see this. But we see first is God gives us blessing. And then, knuckleheads disobey, right? It didn't start today. It's not. It, it, it's been going on. And then what happens is God does judgment. And I'll tell you this. This is going to be a little challenge. But I'm going to say this. God's judgment is mercy. We hit on this a little bit later. We don't like, we don't like judgment. But correcting us when we're wrong is the way that God shows he loves us. Josie, I love your, I love your illustration that you, you gave in the first sermon where you're talking about the difference of one minute of, uh, of angle for you know rockets was whether or not they were going to the moon or the sun right you know and that 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 becomes only that's only millimeters here but later on it's miles and then it's hundreds of miles and thousands of miles so God's little correcting us is God again intervening God meddles and praise God he does he doesn't leave us out there Prophecy is a way in which God meddles in the universe because he says these things will happen. And then they do, and then judgment happens. But understand, for this people that Moses is writing to, see, sometimes we look at these books like they're all ancient history. For them, some of these things were yet to happen, and some of these things had already happened, but it was a promise, hey, this is how it's going to go. So you see this pattern. God's, uh, God uh, got commissions, he blesses. He says, okay, and then humans do something else. Then there's judgment. God corrects things. But then that's even grace and mercy. We'll continue on. So act one. We're looking at this. The cursing of Ham. How many of you ever heard of the cursing of Ham? Kind of this way. Or Canaan. This is one of those that we often skip. Primarily because it's kind of a weird story. But we're not going to. Because it's important. Because right here we see past and prophecy and past. And we just see it all layered out. Starting out right here. So this is the story. After the flood, after the flood Noah began to cultivate uh, in the ground. He planted a vineyard. Uh, one day he drank wine and it made, uh, that he made. And became drunk. And lay naked inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, uh, saw that his father was naked. And went outside and told his brothers. Then Shem and Japheth took a robe, held it over their shoulders, and backed into the tent to cover their father. As they did this, they looked the other way so they would not see, his naked, uh, see him naked. Uh, when Noah woke up from his stupor, he learned what Ham, the youngest son, had done, and then he cursed Canaan, the son of Ham. Now, how many, is this the first time any of you have heard the story? It's kind of a... It's kind of a weird one. It's a hard one. You're like, what's that all about? Well, listen. This, we're supposed to see this because it's linked right to another story. There's another pattern. What is this pattern? Well, do you remember the garden? What happened in the garden? God planted a garden for people to, to have fellowship with God, right? And they ate the fruit of the tree when they ought not to, right? And what was the result of that? Shame and their nakedness. We saw that. Then we see God come in, be merciful, covers up that shame, right? Well, now we see, well, this is the same pattern. So Noah plants a vineyard. Just like that. So we see the same thing. And then they, he partakes in the fruit of the vine, right? We see the same thing. He's gone to drunkenness. And it's shame and nakedness. 
And then what happens is the sons are set there and they, they, they get to choose one of two ways. Ham rejoices in his father's shame. <coughs> right? Isn't that kind of what the serpent was doing? Was like he was trying to get somebody else to get in trouble, right? That's kind of that's the message in the in the garden. Well, what is Jephthah and Shem, what they do is they cover their just like God covered the nakedness of Adam and Eve. It's the same kind of pattern. We're supposed to go. Oh, and when, I'm, when Moses is telling the Israelites this, think about it. They're in the wilderness. They're getting ready to go into, in, into Canaan. And he's kind of talking about how Canaan is going to be land, wiped out. You guys are coming back into the land, just like the flood, just like after the Garden of Eden. You're going to go into the land. God's going to bless you. He's going to give you the land. You're going to build wonderful things in there. Now, the challenge is there's going to be disobedience. And Moses even predicts the fact that there's going to be disobedience. He says, God's going to judge you, and he's going to take you into another land after that. Talks about the Babylonian captivity. But if you're merciful, because you're mer God's merciful, you'll, you'll plead and you'll come back. Now let me tell you this. When Moses is writing this, any idea about when Moses is writing this stuff? Because this is amazing. 1800 years B.C. Do you know when... Do you know when the Babylonians drive, drive people off to, to, uh, to, to Babylon? Like in the six, 600 years B.C. Think about that. So he's writing about events that are going to happen. And we're going to see this kind of this uh, repeat, repeat, repeat. So now we see Canaan. Now why is Canaan important? Well, because all the tribes of the Canaanites are who the Israelites are going to. So he's... Moses is talking to about the curse that happened to Ham, whose descendants are going to be the people in the land that the Israelites are going to displace. And so here we go. He goes, may Canaan be cursed, may his, um, may Canaan be cursed, may, may he be the lowest of servants of his relatives. Then Noah said, may the Lord, the God of Shem, be blessed, and may Canaan be his servant, and may God expand the territories of Jephthah. May Jephthah share the prosperity of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Blessings and curses are all given here. Now here's an interesting thing. How does it describe God? God the God of Shem. We're also going to hear later on, we're going to hear the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, right? When we hear the story of Joseph, the God of Joseph, you see that kind of pattern. And guess what? It's the same family pattern. So Shem, Abraham is going to be descendant of Shem. And if Abraham is descendant of Shem, who else is? Isaac. If Isaac is, who, you know, who else is? Well, David. Well, David, you know, you're going to go, 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 to Jesus. So the family of Shem is, is the blessed one. That's it. And then, so what we see is you see most blessed, you see, see that. But Jephthah, he's, because he, he comes in and he gets to get adopted in. For us, looking, you know, several thousand years later, we're coming back, it's very much to us. The, the, who did, <laughs> when we see Jephthah, we should be thinking the nations, everybody else. Well, what are we? Are we Jewish? If we're not Jewish, you're nations. But where do we worship? We worship in with the tent of Shem. So even in this, when he's making this little... Noah is making this statement, and then it's recorded down by Moses 1,800 years later, and it just kind of been setting down. So 1,800 years later, we got Jesus, and you got Jesus, and then you got the church, and what happens in the church is knucklehead Jews and Gentiles get together, right? So this thing was a prophecy that doesn't get fulfilled for 1,800 years. Think about that. And then we see Ham. We see Ham as kind of the lowest of the servants. Not so good, right? Some bad stuff happens. So even when we see these genealogies, these we got, they're prophecy. So and it's amazing because it's very supernatural. It shows that that you know prophecy had become history, and then history had been prophecy, and, and over and over and over again. And why is that important? It's important for us because it's evidence that God has meddled in history. On a big scale. And that God has meddled in history on a small scale. And knowing how powerfully God has worked before gives us confidence to think, hey, God can work again. Isn't that amazing? Nothing too big for God. 
Uh, this is the account of the families of Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. The three sons of Noah, many children were born to them. And after the great flood, oh, sorry, after the great flood, the descendants of Jephthah were uh, Gomer, Magog, uh, uh, Medea, uh, Yoban, Tubal, uh, Mesh, uh, Meshet, uh, and Tiras. The descendants became the seafaring people. That's a, further down. Descendants became the seafaring people that spread out into various lands. Uh, each identified by its own language, clan, and national identity. Remember how at the very beginning I said in Genesis, really what God does is he sets out uh, in the telling God through Moses, sets out kind of the story where the gospel is. So he sets the stage. He's setting out the stage. He's talking about this is the land. Well, what happens with Jephthah? Well, Jephthah exits stage right. So it's not important right now for the story. It's not important for Moses. So what happens to the descendants of Jephthah? Well, they just become seafaring. They head off stage. It's kind of a foreseen a drama. They played their role. They helped cover it. And God said, hey, we'll be blessed. And you'll be able to dwell in the tents. So we're going, oh, that's going to happen. He's going to dwell in the tents of Shem. And then he exits off stage. We don't know where he's in when he enters back in. He does enter back in later on, right? When we see the church, the birth of the church, is the nations coming into that tent. Isn't that kind of interesting? Again, we see the prophecy in the back. And we see... Past and it comes forward. So that's really him. There, there are other, and I think of when I think of Jephthah, I think of this. Uh, if you guys know what uh, what Jesus or Jesus tells the church, Max one uh, is right in Acts one eight. He says, uh, "And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem." And then he says, "This is funny. I said Jamaria in the first. And I thought it was Jamaria. Judah, Samaria. Yes, but Jamaria sounds." Need. Judah and Samaria, right, which is, Judah and Samaria is the land. That's both, Samaria is the, is the, the folks that aren't Jewish that are living kind of in where the, the, the ten tribes were. And then you've got Judah, so you've got the land is right there. And then the uttermost is this. Well, if you think following these three, three things, the uttermost is Jeff. They're off, off stage. Ham is the folks that are in the land that aren't from Abraham. So here you go. Uh, the descendants of Ham were Cush, Miz, uh, Mizraim, and Put, and Canaan. Cush was the ancestor of Nimrod, who was... What, isn't that a funny name? Now, it's kind of funny, because when we say Nimrod now, we're not, we usually don't mean positive things. But here, Nimrod is positive. Since he was the great hunter in the world, his name became proverbial. People would say, that man is like Nimrod, the greatest hunter in the world. He built his kingdom in the land of Babylonia, the city of Babylon. Uh, now, think about this. So Moses is writing this, 1800 years A.D. Babylon, Babylon isn't going to drag, or sorry, 1400 years uh, B.C. Uh, Babylon isn't going to drag the Jewish folks off into the Babylonian exile for almost a thousand years. Why are they recorded here? They're not even important, but they are. Babylon, the city of Babylon, Eric, uh, Achad, that's going to be important later. These are all, uh, and uh, uh, Kelna. Uh, from there he expanded his ter uh, territory to the Assyrians. Are the Assyrians going to be important later on? Not for a few hundred years in the, in the telling, but it's kind of interesting. I, I thought, and I, I don't know if you guys ever watched the old television shows like... Uh, uh, Bonanza was good this way. Uh, the old, now I think about it, the old Battlestar Galactica. There was like the old 80s, 70s, 80s, 60s. Where what they do is like at the very beginning when they're showing the title screen, they would show scenes of all the people that were going to be later on, you know, and, and you know, Lauren, Lauren, Lauren Green or something. It shows them getting out of the wagon. You're like, oh, that guy's going to be in this one. Oh, that guy's going to be in this one. Oh, that guy's going to be in this one. Think of this. What Moses is writing down is he's doing that. He's saying all these, and this place, and this place, and this place. It's not important to the readers here except for the fact that it will be. A thousand years from that, you're like, wow, he knew that it was going to be in there. From there, he expanded the territory of Assyria, building the cities of Nineveh. Is Nineveh going to play, play an important part? What, sto what story do we know from Nineveh? Jonah. Jonah's not for a thousand years. 
So uh, Reho, Reboth, Ur, uh, Kala, and Reza, the great city is located between Nineveh and uh, Kala, is going to continue on. Again, these are great ancient empires. I, I also said, you know, kind of also known as, you know, Babylon. I bet this is going to be important later on. But more than that, he continues to go in, and Canaan's oldest son, Poseidon, Tyre and Sidon are, are in the land. Tyre, so Sidon, which is the ancestor of the Sidonians. Uh, Canaan was the ancestor of the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Gigasites, the Hivites, the Acherites, the Sinites, the, the Aberdites, the Zemorites, the uh, Hamathites. And the Canaanite clans eventually spread out, and the territory of Canaan extended from Sidon in the north to Ger Gerar in Gaza in the south to the east of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, uh, Adama and uh, Zeboim uh, near Lasha. So what he does is he just draws out, hey, there's, here's a, now it's interesting, all these descendants of Canaan are going to be tribes that Joshua is going to have to fight. Think about that. That's who he's saying. So when he's saying God cursed Ham, he's saying God cursed Ham and by Ham his descendants were Canaanites, who, by the way, that's why you're here. You're here to come push them out. So for them, when they were listening to this, this wasn't an ancient story. I mean, partly it was. Part of it was a thousand years before them. But what they're looking at is they're going, well, this is 2,000 years before us, this is 1,000 years before us, but this is God saying, I'm going to go into the land and these sort of things are going to happen. It's not unlike the fact that from 70 AD, all the Jews get pushed out of the Holy Land. And for 1,900 years, there are Jewish communities all over the world going, hey, one day, we're going to go back into that land. And we, as believers, look in Revelation, and it seems like in Revelation they're talking about a nation of Judah, or sorry, a nation of, uh, of Israel, and we're like, well, I guess it's going to happen. It's prophecy. Now, it, now is nation, the nation of Israel a prophecy for us now, or is it a historical fact? But it was only a fact in 1949. So we look at this and we're like, wow, God works supernaturally throughout everything. But anyway, these are tribes of, of the land that the Israelites will displace. Continue on. The, the sons were born to Shem. Now, we look at the genealogy of Shem. So we, we've talked first. Uh, so the three sons were on stage, right? So one son, uh, one son that follows Jephthah, and he takes his folks and he goes off stage. So then you have Ham, and Ham's become a big guy. He's, he's building folks all over the stage. He's gone over all the stage. And then what we do is with this genealogy, we take Shem, and we follow Gen Shem's genealogy. And it's kind of interesting the way Mo Moses tells Shem's genealogy is really he just does it kind of as a king dynasty. From this guy to this guy to this guy to this guy to this guy, ultimately to Abraham. So the family, family uh, it's a family tree, but it's, it's a different genealogy. The sons were born to Shem, the, uh, the older brother of Jephthah. Shem was the ancestor of all descendants of Eber. The descendants of Shem were in the land. Asher, uh, Ephazan, and you're going to continue, blood. You're going to continue all this way down to Eber. Eventually, later on, he's going to finish the, the genealogy down to Abraham, which, of course, then is the death genealogy all the way to David, which is the genealogy all the way to Jesus. So he's just going to go all down. All right. At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language. So this is the setup. So we've set everything out on the stage, and then now we're talking about what's going on here. At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language, and they used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found uh, a plain in the land of Babylonia, and they settled there. They began saying to each other, let us... Uh, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used for mortar. Then they said, let's uh, come, let us build a great city for ourselves from the, uh, with a tower that reaches to the sky. This way God will make us famous, or sorry, this will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. So this is the story of uh, the Tower of Babel. How many have heard this story? So again, what they say, so we're talking about the land, everybody in the land spoke the same language. Everybody in the land spoke the same language, we got the tower, these folks are saying we're not going to be scattered all over the world. But what was God's, what did God tell us when we just read that in 9-7, he said, uh, be fruitful, multiply, and do what? 
Fill the earth. And their plan is to do what? Not fill the earth. Not fill the earth. So like I said, this is a point where you see, again, that disobedience. And the disobedience is the same. Now, they said it this way, I would say it this way. You're not the boss of me. God said, be, fru be fruitful, multiply, go fill the earth. And we're like, no, we're not going to. By the way, the church in Jerusalem, he said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other parts of the world. And then for quite some time, the center of the church was where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, and they said, okay, we're going to stay right here in Jerusalem. What had to happen there? Persecution. Persecution. Destruction of Jerusalem. Because guess what happens when the city is destroyed? God blesses us by punishing us for disobedience. Go ahead and we go up. Figured that was, that was bonus. That's extra credit. Continuing on. But the Lord came down to the city and, and, the, and the tower the people were, were building. Look, he said, the people are united. They all speak the same language. Uh, after this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. And listen, let me tell you. I've had a problem with this story for so long because I've read it wrong. I've read that as a technological statement. Am I the only one? I've looked at it and said, oh, nothing's impossible, so they can build supercomputers because they're all together. Is that how God saw it? God didn't see it as a technological problem. He saw it as a moral problem. Listen, we've been able to go to the moon while being speaking different languages. It's no problem. The problem was the fact that because they were unified in one language, nothing morally was too far from them. Nothing would be impossible. Nothing would be too far. They had unified in such a way that they're like, listen, and how do I know that? Because what did they say right before that? God's one command to us is to go, go fill the earth. So therefore, we're going to gather together so we don't have to. So they've unified in such a way. So what happens is God comes and blesses them by, by, by punishing them, in a sense. Uh, but let's see, what, what's it say here? It says, come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. And this way the Lord scattered them all over the world. He used their word. But wasn't that the blessing that he said in, in the first place? Your job is to go everywhere, all over the land. Scatter them all over the world. And they stopped building the city. That is why the city is called Babel, because that's where the Lord confused the people uh, with different languages in the way that he scattered them all over the world. You know, sometimes it's so much easier for us to go when God, um, when God gives us first the, if we just listen and read and say, oh, God says, love my neighbor, maybe I should. You know, then sometimes he, we don't. We don't take the first message and we, we end up having to get blessed by punishment. And that's what happens here. But there's another story that we should be looking at in this. And I, you know what, I didn't change the word because I, I struggle with finding this. Because there's, there's another miracle that this is pointing to. But do you see, and I called it a bookend because it's a miracle that's different. Speak in tongues. Speak in tongues. Because what happens is this. In the Pentecost, what happens in the Pentecost? Do you guys remember what happens in Pentecost? Everybody heard it in their own language. Heard the message of Christ. Yes. Except it was, diff it was different than this. Because sometimes we, we read it, some people read it like somebody was saying something and everybody was hearing in different languages. That's not what happened. What happened was God gifted 120 people with the ability to speak in different ways. And they all go out, and they're all speaking the gospel differently, and people were hearing it. So somebody was speaking it in Arabic, and people that spoke Arabic said, hey, that's my tongue. And somebody was speaking it in Persian, and somebody's like, hey, that's my tongue. Or Farsi, or whatever. whatever. But that's, that's what was happening. And really, it's the same thing. Interesting enough, language is a blessing in both spots. Because what's happening is people's disobedience 
They're like, we're not going to listen to you. And they're pulling in. And what it's going to do is it's going to rob them of the beauty of what God intended for them. So God blesses them by splitting them up with languages, right? But then in the church, what do we see in the church? Well, we see it finally. We see the tents come together. We see, we see Shem's tent and we see Jephthah's tent. We see all of those come together under God. And in that blessing, they go out and they use these languages then what to unite the people. See, so many times I've read this, this story has confused me because I read, first of all, that it was a technology problem. It wasn't a technology problem, it was a moral problem. And then I looked at languages as a curse, but languages weren't a curse, they were a blessing, they fixed. Because if they were a curse, would they be in heaven? They mean heaven? No. Doesn't it say people are going to be praising God in every tribe and tongue? We're going to be hearing people, you know, shout Jumbo Jumbo and Jesus, right? They're going to be doing that. Anyway, so book it, that's what I call it. But it's again, it's another one of those points where we see something that was prophetic in the past, it became. Past. It became something that happened, but then it's prophecy further, and it shows God's mentally, it shows God's changing, and it shows God's working. And you know what? For us, it's important always to know that God has worked in the past, because guess what that means? The work in the future. The work in the future. And it means that He can work today. So here's my question for you. In a moment, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, I'll be dismissing you and sending you on your way. Oh, I should give you this. This is a good place to remind you. If there's a prayer request, if you have some need or some way to get connected, uh, there's a the, the connection card that's in the, in the back of the seat in front of you. You can fill that out. You can drop it in our share boxes on the way out. Uh, that's one of those things to do. If you're looking at trying to, to, to get connected, because here's the deal. For us, we're the same thing. That you're not the boss of me thing is the same thing that, that we have done so many times. And you know what? Noah and his family were... Or had been had faith in God and they were righteous and they were doing stuff, but then what happens? Ham happens after that. And you're going to see that over and over and over again. That pattern is going to repeat. And as as Moses is writing this down and, and looking at God's people, right? God's people, and we see the same pattern. Who were Adam's Eve? Adam and Eve were God's people, right? Did they fail? It was God merciful? Cain. He's God's people. He was part of the family. Did he fail? Was God merciful? Noah. He's God's people, right? Did he fail? Was God merciful? See that pattern? Moses is writing this down to a people and he's looking out there and he says, you're God's people. You're probably going to fail. But the good news is God's merciful. And today it's the same thing. Who is the church? The elect. You're God's people. The predestined. However you want to say it. Great. You're the church. You're going to fail. The good news is God's merciful. So my question for you is here. Where are you at in that cycle? We all, we all bounce through that cycle. Where are we at? Is today time for you to accept who your boss is going to be? Are you, is it time to go, okay, Jesus, it's you? Or is it time for you to stop saying, okay, you know what? I said you're my boss, and then all of a sudden, I, at the same time, I've said you're not the boss of me in this area, in this area. It's time for me to give that. If it is, today's the day. Make that course correction when it's only a little bit, Right? When it's, when it's just a little bit of an effort, not a huge effort to get back on the course. See, why is prophecy important in life and fulfillment? Because it shows God knows. And you know what? i got to tell you this. For believers, it's the same way. Now, we've been talking big picture. We've been talking about this. But um, if I use the word testimony in church, uh, what does that mean? When I say testimony, anybody want to share what testimony means? Testimony. If I said, have you shared your testimony? Yeah, we have we have churches all over the place. Testimony is, is telling somebody what God has done in your life. Testimony is this. It's saying, this is how it was before Jesus. 
Because I met Jesus, this is how I am now. Now, in a sense, there's a point there where you see prophecy, you see past, and you see future, all kind of... It is important for believers, and we're called to share our testimony, to give the good news of the gospel that doesn't end 2,000 years ago. The good news of the gospel includes today. Our testimony is how we're woven into the gospel. Because Jesus died on the cross for me. And then we turn around as a prophecy to somebody and he died for you. It's the same. Now for us as believers, it's important for us to share our testimony the same way, the same reason it was for these people here. To say, hey, this is how God has worked in the past in my life. And because of that, when he says that I will one day be with him in glory in the future, I know that because he's fulfilled the past, he's going to fulfill the future. So for us to share our, uh, our testimony, it is important for us for evangelism. But it's also important for us to remember, we need to remember, to remember what God's done for us. Because when we forget what God has done for us, we become very, it's very easy for us to lose. I mean, the way that, that Adam and Eve got sorted in the garden was that they'd forgotten that God loved them. And when the serpent suggested God didn't want good things for them, they bought it. So for us, how God has worked in your past, is that affecting how He works in you today? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that you met, you've meddled in history. That you've meddled in history in big, in big ways through the Bible. But more than that, Lord, we thank you that you've worked uh, individually in big ways in our lives. There have been ways in which you have reached out into the busyness and craziness of our life to give us a message of peace a prophecy of forgive or a prophecy of forgiveness that was fulfilled uh, that was fulfilled first on the cross as Jesus died for us. But more than that, as that message came to us and we said, "Yes, Jesus, we accept you as our Lord and Savior. We believe you died for us." Lord, we know that 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 becomes our past, but also our future, as a prophecy of the future of, of one day when we get to get to heaven and hear that fantastic phrase. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, we thank you for these things. Lord, we pray that as we go out today, that the gospel story that started, started here, we see Moses telling it here uh, nearly, uh, nearly 4,000 years ago, uh, that we see that that gospel story as it continues through Moses, continues up to, up to today, has included us because of our story, how we have been forgiven through the death of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that as we go out, we are faithful messengers of that gospel to people who may not yet know that Jesus died for them. They may not know that they have a God that loves them and wants good things for them. Lord, help us be the right, ver the right tool to share that message. Lord, we thank you for that blessing of that mission, that commission that you gave us. Whereas we are, we, are, we are blessed with the idea of being able to uh, be biologically fruitful, but more than that, Lord, we know that as believers, that great commission is a command for us to be fruitful and multiply there and fill the earth. Lord, help us fulfill that plan. We thank you for all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. My blessing for you is the same blessing I have every week. I know this. But Moses wrote it. It was a good one for Aaron. It's a good one today. I pray that the Lord bless you and keep you. I pray that he makes his face shine upon you, that he's gracious to you and grants you peace. Amen.